you want to live off the land, have some livestock, feed your family with the livestock on your own backyard, right? When you imagine self-sufficiency, is that what you imagine? A field full of like 50 sheep and goats and uh, maybe some big horses, pulling carts, a couple cows, pigs. In today's video, we're gonna talk about how many livestock a large family should have to be as self-sufficient as possible. And we're gonna clue you in on a little secret. You don't need that many livestock. Hello everybody, this is Ask Home Study, the weekly show where we take some time to answer the questions that you viewers have left here on our channel. First, if you would like to have a question answered on Ask Home Study, it's pretty simple. All you have to do is put a question in one of this week's Cummings videos and then add the hashtag, all one word, Ask Home Study, so I can find your question when I go to do this video. Let's get into talking about livestock. Today's question comes from viewer, frequent commenter, Evie. Hey Austin, not sure if you've done something like this before. Could you do a video on how many of each animal you suggest that a large homesteading family, your size, which is six, soon to be seven, uh, going up to as many as 10 people, should have to be as self-sufficient as possible food-wise? Evie asked a very good question. She put lots of details that helps us really give her a good answer. And if you're gonna ask a question like Evie's, uh, be sure to add as many details as possible. Evie mentioned self-sufficiency in her question. So before we answer the question, what I usually like to do, other than adjust my camera, when answering questions about self-sufficiency, I like to define it because self-sufficiency is one of those words that a lot of us use without really thinking about what it means. So here is the probably Wikipedia definition. I don't remember where I got this definition. Self-sufficient, needing no outside help in satisfying one's basic needs, especially with regard to the production of food. This definition is important. If your goal is really focused on self-sufficiency, that means, according to our definition that we're gonna to use today, no outside help. The animals I'm going to suggest to you first, Evie and anybody listening, the dogs are fighting, is focused on absolute self-sufficiency. We're talking, hey! Mr. Gus almost just bit me because he was snapping at Poppy. I don't blame him for snapping at, snapping at Poppy. She can be annoying sometimes. So here's what we're gonna do so that we can answer this question the best for Evie and any of you others who are interested. First thing we're going to do is actually walk off of this hill because it's a little windy up here and it's gonna be hard to hear what I'm saying if it's too windy. The next thing we're gonna do, we're gonna give you two kind of suggestions. The first livestock group suggestion for self-sufficiency is going to be focused on those of you who are trying to be totally off grid, no outside help, self-sufficient, ready for Teotihuacan, the end of the world as we know it. If you're one of those serious self-sufficient people who don't wanna rely on anybody or anything, option number one's gonna be for you. Option number two are for those of you who, like us, want to be more self-sufficient, want to feed our family the best quality food that we can, that we grow right here on our homestead, but don't mind running out to the feed store or calling up an AI guy to impregnate a cow. Uh, more modern self-sufficiency, more modern homesteading. So let's dive into both options for the self-sufficient homestead. What livestock should you plan on having if you want to feed your family? can't talk about running a self-sufficient homestead uh, without talking about your ruminants, your grass feeders. And for option A, those of you who are end of the world, preppers, want to have all the livestock that you need to feed your family no matter what happens, what you're going to really be doing is focusing on good grazers, grass-fed animals because you can take advantage of the feed growing on your hillside or out in your backyard more so than with animals who are perhaps omnivores like pigs. So the first 
suggestion I have for those of you who want to have enough livestock to feed a large, you know, big family, uh, let's talk about sheep and goats. Some sheep are good at milk. All sheep are yummy to eat. Some of them being better at growing meat. And some sheep you can even get fiber from. Now we're not gonna focus on fiber because Evie was nice and specific and she said she wanted to focus on food. So if you're gonna start with sheep and goats, let's talk about sheep first. I would suggest getting, for a family my size or a little bit bigger, two to four ewes and one ram. When you first purchase your two to four ewes, try to find two to four that are from different bloodlines. That way, as you produce more and more, if you're self-sufficient and you're trying to not use outside farms, outside sources for breeding, you'll have enough different bloodlines on your own farm uh, to do some crosses and continue breeding if you have different bloodlines. So two to four ewes, one to two rams, if you're a very small family and you're new at this, I would start with two ewes and one ram. Rams can be a little, well, rams can definitely be dangerous, especially if they have big horns, so you have to learn how to work around rams. But they're a great source of food and they can be raised on complete grass. Uh, lamb is delicious, sheep is also good. Um, what's the word they call sheep, that fancy word? Mutton. <laughs> Good way to feed your family, and you can find some that will produce milk as well. I would not suggest looking for a dual purpose meat and milk when it comes to sheep. Goats are trying to eat my hat. I would suggest getting some hair sheep because they are very low maintenance. And if you got two to start with, two ewes, eventually get your own ram to breed them with and maybe grow your herd out. Uh, that's a very good way to be self-sufficient on one type of meat. Now let's talk about the animals that are going to knock over my camera here, the goats. Okay, all right everybody. Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. We gotta talk about goats. Uh, I have been known to be pretty negative about goats in the past. Goats are, well, they're pesky and they get into trouble. But they are an awesome dual purpose animal, especially Nubians like the ones that we have here. A nice, oh, good lace, good lace, okay. A good goat like uh, Lacey here, a nice Nubian will produce, a good quality Nubian can produce a gallon of milk a day. And she can also have kids, which if you get some males, you can use for meat. So great dual purpose. They have a high butter fat milk, lots of volume if you get a good line. The males can be very meaty, good large sized males. So great for a self-sufficient homestead, and like sheep, they too can be raised on what you have growing around your homestead. Now, they're not grass-fed necessarily. Goats are going to prefer more browse on weeds and uh, weeds and that kind of thing. But that makes them a great option to put on a self-sufficient homestead where they can eat some of the stuff the sheep don't like and vice versa. When we want to talk about the amounts for goats, what you should have, again, I would, if you're a family our size, start with two does, different lines, one buck, they can breed. And if you're a bit bigger, like a family of 10, as Evie mentions, maybe up that to three does or even possibly four does. Each of those does will produce, if they're good quality, could produce you a gallon of milk. So a large family consuming lots of milk could have in theory, four gallons of milk a day, as well as each of those does could yield multiple kids, which you could select the best stock from, and the ones that you didn't like weren't the best quality you could have for meat. So great dual purpose. Courtney wanted to know, if you're planning on getting sheep and goats, can you keep them together? And the answer is probably. Hey, pup. If you have a large enough paddock or pasture, as you saw over the hill, there are lots of sheep and lots of goats. You might not have seen any goats out this morning, but trust me, there are lots of them. They all do just fine on the same, in the same pasture because there's lots of space. The goats can go off to their side, the sheep can go off to their side. That even works in a smaller area. You don't need acres and acres. You can have a paddock kind of the size of the ones that we have here and still have sheep and goats living nicely together as long as you don't have one goat who's particularly mean 
or uh, one sheep, but I would usually bank on the goat being particularly mean or dominant. So you'll have to watch your particular animals to make sure that they're gonna be okay together. Sheep cannot have copper, a little too much copper and they're dead. Some goat feeds have copper in it, and if you feed everybody at the same time and they nibble on each other's feed, you can have sheep dropping dead on you. So pay attention to how you feed them and what's in the feed. We've got our milk and our meat covered, but now there's more things to eat and drink than milk and meat. So let's talk about adding some, well, fowl to the mix. Get fowl on your farm. If you're going totally self-sufficient, no outside inputs, chickens are a great option to add to the self-sufficient homestead. A nice flock, as you can see behind me, of somewhere between 10 to 20 chickens will be really good for a large family. In peak laying time, you're gonna get too many eggs, but that's okay, eggs last a long time. So you can set some aside for those time periods where you get less eggs. And then in the winter time, you're not gonna get that many eggs. Pick a couple hens, you can butcher them. Uh, a nice sized flock like we have here would have plenty of chicks, which they can incubate themselves. A couple of roosters mixed in with 10 to 15 hens can keep reproducing. You'll have meat, you'll have eggs. It's a great option for someone who's looking for a very self-sufficient homestead that can keep on producing with few outside inputs. Now if you look particularly hard at my flock, you'll notice there's a couple of funny looking chickens. They're not chickens. We also have ducks and we have guineas. If you're looking to be a self-sufficient homestead, minimal inputs, ducks are actually probably a better option than chickens. You don't find many here on our homestead because I am allergic to duck eggs, so there's not much point in having a lot of ducks. But for your homestead, if you're not allergic to duck eggs, ducks are better foragers. For those of you looking to be self-sufficient, ducks will do better eating grubs and bugs off of the land. They're better in bad weather and in inclement weather, they do better with colder temperatures and in rainy weather. They will produce more eggs per year compared to chickens and their eggs are bigger. So if self-sufficiency is your goal and you like duck eggs, you could replace all your chickens with ducks. You could do a half and half mix. Ducks are a great option for a self-sufficiency focused homestead. Now, if you're thinking about getting ducks and chickens, Maybe you want the best of both worlds because there are some things about chickens that are better than ducks. Maybe you're wondering, can I keep them together? That's what super fan, homesteady pioneer Dave asked. And uh, homesteady pioneers, you're the reason we can do this show. If you're not a homesteady pioneer, but you watch our show every day, you know, you ask questions on Ask Homesteady, you can't imagine life without homesteady, maybe consider clicking right there, becoming a pioneer because Without Homesteady Pioneers, guys like Dave, uh, this show doesn't happen. So thank you, Dave, and all the other Homesteady Pioneers. Dave wanted to know, can you keep chickens and ducks together? They're thinking about getting some Muscovy ducks. They already have chickens. Will they be okay together? And the answer is yes, Dave. As you can see, our Muscovies and our ducks, I mean, our Muscovies and our chickens are all together. They get along just fine. They're once in a while you will read about male ducks harming female chickens, drakes, and yeah, I'm, I'm mixing up, the duck people are gonna get mad at me here. We've never had a problem with drakes and hens mixing. Sometimes you'll read about drakes and hens, uh, the drakes can harm the hens. We've never seen it. Our ducks and our chickens have always mixed very well. If you have a small backyard flock, lots of room, you can put them together just fine never seen a problem and they all do go in the same coop or uh, barn in this instance self-sufficiency not having any outside inputs is still not totally easy for someone who has just sheep and goats and chickens. I want to read you a couple quotes from people much smarter than I am with much more experience than I do in homesteading and small farming. A first quote is from 
Susan Shonian, who is like a sheep and goat master. She is a specialist at the University of Maryland's Western Maryland Research and Education Center. Here's what she has to say about totally grass feeding sheep and goats. Producing lamb and goat from 100% grass diet is not without its challenges. There are more external variables to manage on pasture than in confinement or dry lot. Excellent pasture and grazing management is necessary to achieve adequate growth and maintain health of lambs and kids. So what does that mean? Well, if you're trying to be totally self-sufficient and you're thinking, I'll have sheep, I'll have goats, and I'll have chickens, you need really good pastures and you need really good pastures year round. So if you live in New Zealand, you could probably be really self-sufficient without many external inputs. If you live somewhere like we do in Pennsylvania, you're gonna have a long winter where you need hay. Do you have hay on your property? You can harvest hay by hand if you're one of these Teotihuacan end of the world prepper homesteaders. You can pile up hay by hand. Maybe you have a tractor and you can make your own hay, but it's something to consider. The same goes for chickens. You see these chickens out here in the paddock and they're picking through cow pies and scratching the dirt and getting bugs and grubs and you think, boy, I could just free range my chickens and I wouldn't have to buy them any feed. And all over the internet you find all kinds of things saying how to raise chickens without buying feed and how to raise chickens without spending any money. And the fact is, and here's another quote that I'm going to read to you, chickens cannot survive for very long eating only grass. Chickens are not able to digest grass because unlike cows, they do not have necessary microflora populations in their digestive tracts. That is, chickens are not ruminants. As a result, chickens are not able to get sufficient nutrition from grass alone. A number of different insects that chickens will eat are attached to grass, so they become an additional source of nutrients for chickens. Chickens on pasture can typically get from zero to 10% of their nutritional requirements from grass and insects. Did you hear that? Zero to 10% of their nutritional requirements. So even though they're good at foraging and getting bugs and scratch, you will still need some good quality feed. You can grow that yourself and grind that yourself, but it's highly unlikely that most of you homesteaders or future homesteaders will have the equipment or the money to buy that equipment. I know of people who've done it. I've seen it once in a blue, blue moon. But if you're like us, you probably aren't in a position to grow your own. You can supplement their diet by raising bugs. You can do soldier fly larvae and that sort of thing. You better keep that soldier colony, soldier fly colony going year round. And it's just one of those things. So these are good options for the more self-sufficient focused, but they're not perfect. You're still gonna need some hay, some feed, maybe some medication. These are the ones I would suggest for those of you who want, you know, nothing else, uh, but it's still gonna require some outside input. And that quote, by the way, was from extension.org. I'll have links below to the quotes that I've read, uh, good articles to consider. Now, there are a couple that I consider kind of bonus livestock. Maybe they're not what you traditionally think of livestock, but they would be really good for a homestead focused on pure self-sufficiency, minimal inputs. The first one was bees. If you like the idea of working with bees, you're interested in them, they do require very little external sources. The second bonus round uh, livestock that I have, and it's a bonus because it won't work for everyone, uh, but if it would work for you, it would be a really good one, is fish. If you have some body of water or a spot on your property where you could put a pond, kind of get it off and running with bait fish, stock it with either catfish, bluegills. If you're in warmer weather climates, you could do tilapia. But it's a great way to feed a lot of your family members and to have a little bit of fun fishing. Now we do not homestead to prep for the end of the world. We homestead to feed our family the best quality food that we can. And we know the best way to do that is to raise it right here. So if you're homesteading more focused on that kind of self-sufficiency, taking control of your food chain, uh, knowing what you're putting on your family's table, but you're not worried about buying hay, buying some feed. If that's your goal, then stay tuned for part B of this episode, where we're gonna get into the other livestock you'll wanna consider bringing onto your homestead. If your goal is to feed your family and not 100% self-sufficiency. 
If you like this episode, then you're going to love being a homesteady pioneer. We have a master class all about raising chickens, one about raising feeder pigs. There's so much bonus content all about livestock for you out there who are interested in livestock. Click here to become a pioneer or watch this video to learn more.